Hello, everyone. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is July 23rd, year 2023, 4 p.m. PDT. Welcome, one and all. Let's see if uh, you can hear me over in the live chat. Please let me know. I want to make sure that the audio settings are fine and everything is um, is a go here because I have a lot of videos to show you. I'll try to keep it at a minimum because this is a huge, expansive topic. And I title it In Praise of the Retro Hipster. Hi, Corky. Thank you for uh, letting me know. <laughs> and uh, 96 Tears, a uh, question mark and Mysterians. Yeah. Only a hipster would know who question mark and Mysterians might be. And uh, 96 Tears. Uh, but today's talk is titled In Praise of the Retro Hipster, and I'm talking about the affected hipster, that is the people who are working in Silicon Valley and sort of like the Elon Musk types or the ones that used to go to Burning Man. Now it's been superseded by some other really cool uh, globalist uh, alternative event, right, because it's been co-opted, uh, as you might imagine, and I'm going to be spending some some time, but not a lot, on the nuances between the uh, co-opted version and the real version, which is really of more importance to me. But I preface the concept of the hipster with retro hipsters because a lot of what they're into on a cultural level and even on a economic level now, because part of this talk is trying to grapple with the implications of this demographic group moving through the economy, right? They're, um, they're, they, thank goodness they left schools. So they don't have to listen to their, um, their, their lesbian and, and gay professors promoting the gay agenda so that they can get promoted and tenure and all that. Uh, because we're seeing that post-college, it probably takes about five to 10 years. They're, they're, the so-called retro hipsters are forming families. My gosh, <laughs> we're going to the 1950s all over again, perhaps. I don't know. Um, but with a big difference, a major difference. They're not just replicating or repeating what we've already gone through. They're, they have transformed. And again, I'm speaking of this demographic group in a composite global term. And I know they're they're... They're, they're not a monolithic block, so please forgive me for the conceit of calling this huge population uh, retro hipsters. Uh, it's a global phenomenon in every advanced capitalist country and even maybe socialist countries. I'm not really sure what's going on in North Korea or in Cuba. I think they're a little bit behind the curve there. So far behind the curve that maybe a lot of retro hipsters are identifying with them for the wrong reasons, right? the idealized, romanticized version of actually existing socialism, actually existing communism. That's their favorite phrase. Not the retro hipsters, but the fake academic hipsters. They're always in search of the actually existing communist regime. Now, the retro hipsters have found out to, 10 years out of college or a few years out of grad school are finding out that there is no such animal as actually, a, well, there is, but they're all failed. <laughs> the United States of America is, 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 is about the best you're going to get at this time, at point in time in 2023. And uh, what's exciting about the retro hipsters is, is that they're going to make it better as a demographic and identifiable. This is not just me saying this. Right. As usual, there's all kinds of academic literature to support my claims here. I just don't want to bore you with that. I've read a lot of the articles. But if you have an adult child in college and university and they're looking for a paper, a research paper, the dreaded research paper topic, I'll post some of those articles and it could be kind of like um, a yeast starter culture and they can do a paper on on hipster culture and the professors or the graders, they'll, they'll eat it up. They'll dig it. Uh, and they'll, they'll definitely read it because it's kind of like a, a mirror held to themselves. So you're going to get a lot of mileage out of this 
talk here. And if you are acquainted with or are a father or a mother, uh, a parent to a hipster or a millennial, whatever they're called by Wall Street and the advertising uh, industry, then please share this with them because um, I'm very much on their side. And I'm not telling what you think, what you should think or what you should believe, but I think you should be too for your own sake, your own self-survival and for your own amusement because they are a really fun bunch of people and they are bettering the quality of life in depression era America circa 2023. Yes, even in the midst of one of the worst economic downturns in the post-war period, they're rejuvenating certain sectors of the economy that a lot of doom and gloomers had written off, especially their professors, their Marxist professors who are, you know, the, the Francis Fox Piven or Richard Cloward and all those other people, right, that are always name checked by these um, doom and gloom indie conservative media people. Right. This is a, a video for those doom and gloomer indie, indie people because, no, you're part of the problem. You're talking down an entire group of people, a demographic, if you want to call them that, human beings, flesh and blood human beings who you and me and all of us are dependent on to rejuvenate the culture, the society, and importantly, the political economy, the economic system. Okay, how is that going to happen? First of all, I want to clarify, do not confuse the retro hipster with the uh, the woke people. They're not synonymous. There is some overlap. I will admit that. But as you will see by the end of this presentation, I'll try to keep it down to 90 minutes hard because I was reliving my own hipster past. Uh, I've aged out of being cool when starting when I was 17 and 18 and decided it wasn't really worth uh, pursuing, right, being, being cool. So, um, but um, th there are certain retro aspects of it that it's near and dear to me because I grew up with it. I caught it the first time around, right? If I'm being a little vague here, let me just talk to you a little bit about very briefly because I'm going to bore you with some of my record collection that I was looking at in the garage. They re rediscovered vinyl, but vinyl was my life. We didn't call it vinyl. We called them LPs. We called them records. This is before the digital age. So I was buying uh, Flyright Records. So I know the owner of it, by the way. Uh, I don't know if he still heads this. It's Mono and Glorious Mono. Magic Rocker, right? Magic Sam, Sam McGitt out of Chicago, the West Side. T-Bone Walker. This is a guy from my father's age. Right. Just to give you a brief example of this whole notion of hipsterism, I went home one day and I was just so excited to tell my father about this old guy I saw at the Ash Grove. His name was T-Bone Walker. And my dad said, because my dad was a professional musician and early he, he gave it up. He, in fact, he, he tried his best to dissuade me from going anywhere near the music business. Um, Despite that, he, he did support it in his own way. He bought me a, a Selmer, French Selmer clarinet when I was in high school and uh, as a graduation present from college. He bought me a Selmer Mark VI saxophone. These are all top of the line French Selmer instruments. He didn't care about me playing guitar for, for him. He was a jazz guy, right? So clarinet, saxophone, all those jazz instruments. Uh, guitar was too hippie for them. But anyway, he, he said... T-Bone Walker, he said, I saw T-Bone Walker when I first came to L.A. back in 1948 or when he moved from Hawaii to, to um, the mainland, Los Angeles area. So he grew up, he knew who T-Bone, he had seen him in the show. They were at the same age. So anyway, what's old, what's new is is old. So I said, oh, my gosh, I'm rediscovering something that, um, you know, my, my parents had um, already lived through. And uh, we're seeing a similar process taking place here with this intergenerational transfer of cultural, social, and hopefully political knowledge, as well as the transfer of wealth, because none of us boomers are going to be here forever, right? And I know there's some people within the anti-boomer crowd who want to see us hasten that process, but uh, while I'm here, I'm going to be sharing some of this transgenerational, not tranny generational, but this trans 
generational knowledge and skill set that I've acquired over my decades of life. And it's not going to be painful like some geezer telling you about how great records were and how I hate CDs and streaming and Amazon and I hate Lady Gaga and Madonna is, 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 a, is a Satanist and blah, blah, blah. Okay, you've heard that. All you have to do is watch um, uh, Glenn Beck or Alex Jones or some of those people who are, who are uh, as we see now, um, are part of the controlled indie opposition. However, they are very helpful in that. Uh, they have such a wide scope of a, a wide reach that they do bring people in to little dinky channels like myself, where I, I deal with substantive issues and not headlines, right? For those of you who are subscribers and have seen my talks over the past two and a half years, and if you're just new to this channel, subscribe right now and share it, especially with the retro um hipsters or the hipsters, whoever, that the younger generation, your adult children or your teenage children, the millennials, whatever demographic, share it with them because I don't do reaction videos. Most of those shows now just take the headlines and go, oh, that's crazy. Joe Biden, Hunter Biden is a pervert. And then they move on to another high. Oh, that's crazy. Hillary Clinton wants to uh, you know, control the world. Uh, oh, and then they read, oh, yeah, Michael Obama is a trans. I mean, how many times do we have to hear that? And where's the meat, right? I'm giving away a certain catchphrase that the great Clara Peller, who I don't know who she is. She's a, she was an octogenarian actress, and I think for Wendy's or something. So where's the beef? Where's the beef? But a little shrinking hamburgers. Um, so where's the beef in all that stuff? There, there is none, okay? So subscribe to my pitifully undersubscribed channel, and also, and the Patreon numbers are going up. Thank you very much. I welcome all the new patrons. Uh, and it gives me um, some uh, hope and some satisfaction that there are people there that, that recognize quality, even though it's not delivered to you in 20-second little reaction video headline bites, right, a la Ben Shapiro. It's the goldfish attention span model that, by the way, the uh, retro hipsters have abandoned that. Yeah, they're still rocking the, the the iPhone 11 or 12 or whatever iteration is on there. But uh, a lot of them are into reading. <laughs> Can you believe books? Not necessarily Kindle. Uh, book sales are, are at an all-time high. I'm talking about, you know, these. Remember these? They're an all-time high. And guess what other retro technology is an all-time high? Since 85 or 87, I can't remember the exact year that vinyl records started outstripping the sales of CDs, compact discs. So this is not a new trend. It looks like it's something permanent and enduring. Now, it's my job as a cultural forensic specialist to try to make some sense out of it to encourage the positive and healthy aspects of this demographic transformation and to discourage the less helpful and the, the definitively unhelpful healthy aspects of what's being put forth and uh, targeting the uh, retro hipsters. They're in the ideal demographic range. Nothing is marketed to people of my boomer generation. We're on social security. We're on fixed incomes. If we have a pension, we, we got a little coming in on there. You know, some, some people made out well. Some people are just kind of, you know, Lipping along here, but uh, there's no merchandise or services except for um, insurance and health uh, policies that are being marketed to this generation of mine. But but the um, the retro hipsters in particular are a, a ripe target. How do I know this? Not just me. Impressionistically, I saw that, but I looked at the literature and it's huge. So if you are a retro hipster or a older teenager and find out the college and university is not for you, and I, I don't blame you, it's not for everybody, it is kind of cool that you meet a lot of weird different people and you get to hear speakers who you only see on YouTube or in documentary. They'll come to your campus and they'll, they'll talk. You might not even like them, but uh, that's one of the the aspects of, of a college, a four-year experience, a residential experience that, that has not so far been um, 
surpassed. So I'm not denigrating that as a lot of people in the independent media will do and do. But on the other hand, I'm not valorizing or fetishizing that education, right? You've got immigrants who've been here for 20 years, which is a really short time if you're come to this country with no English language ability already. And they're like pulling in hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> I'll show you some concrete examples of that. Uh, I knew something was going on, but but this preparing for this talk allowed me to do a little bit more of a in-depth, and it's not exhaustive by any means, but a little bit more, a less than superficial look in what I suspected. And I first, uh, I'll tell you about the food trucks first. The first glimmer of that I got is when um, they're not so plentiful around where I am. They should be. The food trucks should be in every metropolitan city because that, that enhances the food culture. Uh, in any other major metropolitan city around the world, and I haven't been around, all around the world, I like to, but, but in all the cool global cities from Tokyo to Paris to Frankfurt to London to uh, Distrito Federal, Mexico City, in other words, they all have a very lively street food culture. And we got away, that was hijacked, it was stolen. Well, it never really got off the ground because we were too dispersed as a society. Automobiles and the highway system brought together. Um, we're talking about cities that are like hundreds of years old and they have a, a really um, uh, compacted type of living arrangement. But nonetheless, the food culture in some of the larger cities has improved. and includes the, the coffee culture. And I'm not talking about Starbucks, but definitely uh, Schulz. Uh, What's his Howard? Is it Howard Schultz? I don't know if he's still involved with Starbucks. He probably traveled around and saw the coffee culture in Paris or some um, somewhere and or or in Berlin, anywhere outside the US, and said, Hey, you know what? America is ready for a really decent cup of coffee and probably even coffee drinks. And not surprising, that's a huge, uh, it's been a huge growth sector. And you can look up the information yourself. It's very competitive. This is America. America, if you look under, in the dictionary under America, amongst the synonyms will be competition, right? It's not, so far, if we can help it, it's not state centralized control. This is what they're trying to get us into. And the retro hipsters, even though they might profess socialist or collectivist views by benefit of the type of gig economy they're working on, working in, or their own little retail or food services um, are countering that centralized corporatist model that is dying right now. It is dying and they know it. They might not be able to articulate it. You know it. Right. And you think you got over the finish line because you're collecting Social Security and a little bit of pension. But but your welfare is dependent upon the productive class in the society. And guess what? That's the retro hipsters. So doesn't it make sense for you, for me, for everybody, wherever, whatever region of the country you live in? And retro hipsters are all over the place. They're not just all concentrated in San Francisco and they're not all gay. In fact, they're all the minority of them are gay and GLBT. That's just coming out from indie media that gives you that warped perception. Most of them are starting families, right? And they have the same issues as your as you did or your parents did when they were had little youngins. Like, what how do we educate these kids, the little rugrats? They're helpless. They need to be taught. They need a moral education. They need to learn their ABCs and and counting or you know their maths and uh, they don't need to be known about CRT and and uh, and uh, gay studies they can major in that if they want to in college and by the time the good news about is when the the infants of today's um, post millennial or retro hipster generation by the time they get to college all that curriculum will be dead right i said this in the last show Right, when I critique the whole Disney World curriculum, right, and the queerization of the attempted but failed queerization of American society and global society has failed. Your model has failed, right? I mentioned that, and it's the same way in the academic world, 
right. even though there's a lot of academic literature trying to prop up the whole Disney vision. All right, I, should, I forgot to post them on my page, and I will, and you can pass it on to your college-aged uh, daughter or son or both um, so they can do a paper on <laughs> And their professor will guarantee to read it because it's a hot topic in academia. See, in, in the academic world, they're always behind the curve. It's hot. By the time it becomes a hot topic in academia, the trend is already over. All right? The trends, the real organic trends happen in the community of the grassroots. And it, it, it's, it's nowhere as well illustrated as by the, the movement of the so-called retro hipsters into these areas where no middle class person would dare tread. Right? And I know and I'm not going to focus on that much because there's all kinds of material out there. Oh, they're a bunch of squatters. They're driving up the ramps and they're they're buying, they're moving into these these uh, historic neighborhoods. And where are all the immigrants going to leave? They're driving up prices and all that. You have enough of that material and that doom and gloom propaganda, which is what it is. It's part of the demoralization of America propaganda effort out there. So just set that aside. That's not what this video is about. This video is about growth. It's about vit vitality, revitalization, creativity, the creative economy, as some economists, academic economists have called it, right? And yes, I know a lot of it's BS, but, but a lot of it is organic and it's real and it's substantive and it's enduring and it's the engine for the revival, the recover of the American, the larger American national economy without having to go overseas and transferring a bunch of weapons brokered by retired colonels and generals to dictators in Ukraine or wherever it is, whatever client state it is. Taiwan is a big client state. I don't know if you realize that. I don't want China to invade Taiwan. Don't get me wrong. But be behind Israel, I think they're the number to recipient of so-called foreign aid. And they're all brokered by um, retired generals and colonels who, who predominate on indie media, right? Yeah, a lot of their material is really good and important, 9-11 and the whole COVID's coming up, but but it's, it's still a military, quasi-military operation. They might be even anti-NATO, but it's still run by a bunch of retired generals and colonels who work for these consulting agencies and run a lot of indie media. That's their engine. And I mention this is because your retro hipsters are not part of that world. I would, I defy you to find very many um, hipster, retro hipster that even served in the military. Not that it's a bad you know, decision in your life, but they weren't socialized at age 17 and a half or 18, or they were in ROTC in college into that cradle to grave, which is a lie. All you have to go to is, is down to the Los Angeles Veterans Administration Hospital, any major VA hospital, and you'll see the homeless encampments of veterans who've been forgotten after they've been used up. All right. The hipster economy is not about militarism, from what I can tell, just you know, quite the opposite. Although I'm sure they, they will welcome former military who um, have certain survival <laughs> skills. <laughs> because no matter who you are, you're going to have to learn how to defend yourself. And um, that'd be a good niche for one of you entrepreneurial types who, who want to um, start a business. I would start a hipster uh, with a hipster demographic clientele, a uh, hipster uh, shooting club. You know, call it a sports club, a recreational club, but it's really about shooting and firearms and uh, edged weapons and bull, you know, staffs and, and clubs and um, uh, you name it. Because whether you use it or not, the, the mentality is uh, is important, which is Americana, by the way, right? Unfortunately, you know, the Pentagon said, okay, now we're, thank you very much, you hard-ass Americans. Now we're taking over and you're going to go to war. You're going to be our slaves. Our wage lays to the Pentagon and then emerge with NATO. Okay, and I'm mentioning this because part of our function here, at least my function, is to 
wise the or hip, hip the uh, retro hipsters to these globalist agendas, which instinctively or they've been trained to default toward it. So when you hear the term United Nations, you and me say, Ugh, uh, right, it's cringeworthy. But for them, it has it has a warm, fuzzy associations, right? What could be bad with nations that are united? Right? Their assumption they're going to be united in peace and commerce and free travel. That is without, you know, overly intrusive um, uh, cops and uh, military people checking you at every border within the country <laughs> or at the airports, right? Yeah, what can be wrong with it? But but they don't understand the large the 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 poison within the rat formulation, right? And this is where um where we can help them. And by the way, they're very, very receptive to these new sources of knowledge because they didn't get it at the university, they didn't get it at college. They haven't been getting it for about 30 years. So they're starved for this information, they're hungry for it. And you can see that by the numbers of uh, the proliferation of these channels on TubeU that are being supported now by these defectors from what used to be called political correctness. I call them retro hipsters. Because they're returning, not materially, but their psychology is more rem reminiscent of the counter 60s counterculture. I know a lot of you are going to find that repulsive because you read Dave McGowan and you read a lot of psyops saying that the counterculture was all CIA and all the alternative this and that was all CIA and all C so, right that's part of the demoralization process to convince you that everything is synthetic everything will be synthetic including cultural products food living space news all synthetic but I'm here to tell you that the retro hipsters are the living embodiment of of the false reality that indie media is portraying. So yeah, I can kind of understand why they're put out by all these um, uh, characters out there who are, who are just out there as alienation machines. I can understand that, right? So understand, I'll repeat it again. The retro hipsters are not synonymous with Antifa. Antifa is not, or BLM. They're not synonymous with BLM or, all, or any of those groups that are synthetic. Those are military operations. They're security operations. Just like January 6th was a military operation, psyops. This is what we, the information is, is, is getting out. It's circulating. I'm not the only one who is advancing these. You've got a huge receptive audience who were taught otherwise when they were in college or as young people, right? Listening to Red Bull seminars the red bullshit is what it is right you know that so-called energy drink just check i should do a whole talk on red bull they really and i mentioned that because there's a lot of companies that that got on the retro hipster bandwagon early on and try to steer it in the globalist direction by passing themselves off as hip-hop you can't stop or alternative or whatever new is down you know, is, is emerging organically. There you will find the Red Bull music seminars, right? You know that hip hop is, has been quiet. You know that when they started dying like Tupac Shakur, you know that there was a war against hip hop, right? Just like they killed the black martyrs of the 1960s, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., right? And, you know, Robert Kennedy, senior john f kennedy right and um by the way i'm going to be um you got to give me some time because i'm getting the music collecting i ordered a bunch of uh, jason aldean cds i didn't have a single one because i tend not like not like uh what's called bro country <laughs> you know that really highly produced overproduced i think it's, although he has some kind of retro country elements in there, but it's still a little bit too contempo Nashville for me. But I'm going to, because he's in the news right now, and um, it's, this gives me the opportunity to revisit 
the Las Vegas shooting with Stephen Hadley. Remember that? Keep that in mind. It's a major false flag operation that has been lost down the memory hole. But I got this book, and this is probably talking about, oh, what a human tragedy is, and it's, you know, but very predictable, but I got to read it. Um, and there are some academic articles, and they're very predictable. Right? Oh, it, 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 the PSYOP worked. It worked. Not for us, not for you, but for the uh, opinion makers who were in the classroom or write uh, for the journals of opinion or for the news organs. Um, and, and where J Jason Aldean fits into the picture is because he was on stage at a Highway 91 country music. I can't remember the exact name, so don't ding me on that, okay? Because I don't have it scripted on. But he was at a country music festival, thousands of people there, open air, when the shots rang out. You know, kind of remember the scenario. So I'm going to revisit it. Jason Aldean was there. And then recently he's been um, indicted by the anti-retro hipster group. And we got to wean them away from those news sources. But they are reading a lot of books and they are reading a lot of alternative magazines and they're, they're producing them themselves, the editorial content. That's part of the hipster, retro hipster ethic is D, it kind of came out of punk, right? In the 70s and a DIY do it yourself, which was later hijacked. And uh, someone told me that Johnny Rotten uh, is now married to an heiress, lives in some ultra elite gated community. I don't know, but the fact is Sex Pistols were an organic group originally. All right. But that ethic is still there, and it's uh, there out of necessity. Corporate cradle-to-grave model of employment died with their parents, me, the boomer generation. That, In fact, that was gone 20 years ago. And those of uh, that cohort are still hanging to that illusion are going to be in for a rude awakening unless they have a really vibrant side hustle or multiple side hustles in addition to the main gig that covers the insurance, the medical, the dental, and uh, these other inflated expenses that cut into your paycheck, right? Assuming that you'll be able to even collect on Social Security 40 years from now. So you got to, and so they know this instinctively that they need to gig they need to network. They need side hustles. They need to get into to, uh, ghettonomics, right? The poor people in America have already figured out different ways, strategies of dealing with a economy of forced deprivation, right? But now that economy of forced deprivation and false scarcity is hit the educated middle class, which historically, at least since the post-war period in America, has been the engine, the motor of economic growth. Again, another reason why we should support hipster businesses. Instead of going to Starbucks, go to the local cafe that's run by hipsters and owned. You know, they they have a roaster right next door. That's what I do. And it's better. It tastes better, right? It's better for you. It's better for the client. It's supporting them. And the same with the food. Uh, almost every metropolitan area nowadays has a food co-op, right? I'm a member of the Sacramento Food Co-op. Uh, I was a member of the Sacramento Food Co-op and the Davis Food Co-op until they became aggressively rainbow colored, right? Along weakened, Sabatine, Frankist, Luciferian lines. I said, no, I'm not gonna support that. Again, you have to be on guard that in all these organic movements, the Sabatine Frankists, the mixed multitudes always want to join Moses to the exodus, right, out of slavery into freedom. The mixed multitude concept can be applied, the Erev concept can be applied to the hipster, the burgeoning hipster economy. What do I mean by burgeoning hipster economy? Let me be more specific. And again, this is not a uh, uh, economic tip sheet, right? And if you listen to any economic tip sheet that's coming from the conservative circles that are that are uh, supporting and um, sponsoring, they're not any of my sponsors, 
the so-called indie channel. It's always gold and it's always the sky's falling, the economy's going to collapse and we're all doomed and going to go to hell. Right? And buy all everything you can from the Fear Ranger, Mike Adams. Right? Shut down the economy. The Chacoms are coming. Right? Fear mongering. And that's where the hipsters have it over the so-called conservatives. They're not, they don't live in fear. Not like we do, or not we've been trained to along these dog whistle lines, okay? So this is not the video you're expecting, and I'm not going to dump on them. I'm dumping on ourselves and saying that this is where the action is. What do I mean by this vibrant, robust economy? Just to give you some you know, you want facts, I'll give you a craft beer, right? Forget about Bud Light. That's all you hear about so-called indie conservative. Oh, yeah, the sales have gone down. It shows the American people are voting with their power. So what BFD? It's just some other beer company that's getting your dollars, right? So let, why not focus on craft beers, craft Right. You can hear the word craft and artisanal a lot in this talk and in their own intercommunications. They talk about craft, and that's good. That's Americana. That's very 50s. That's really pre-war. DIY, right? Family raising, self-education, taking care of, of your own because they understand. They may not understand the conscious or intellectually. They realize that the mega state is not going to provide for them, number one. And the global entities, some of the smarter ones have figured out, are, go are against them and they want to shut them down. So I just did a just kind of a casual look at the at the beer, <laughs> at the beer, um, what they call, uh, dist not distilleries, that's hard liquor, um, brew pubs, right? which means they have food and usually the food's really good. Right, good hamburgers made from really good beef, right, and and other men, menu items, salads or whatever, whatever is to your taste, and and beer, craft beer. There's one right here, five minutes. Maybe I'll go there after I finish this talk. It's so hot. I need <laughs> I need a cold one. It's called Device Brewery. There's one in in the the the, the cool hipster community in downtown, and I'm in this outside of Hipsterville. I'm in I'm in the suburbs of, Sac of Sacramento, Hollywood for ugly people, right? That's where G Gavin Newsom tries to avoid being associated with. He's a Sacramento. I mean, he's really a San Francisco guy, but he his the governor's mansion and, and the state house is in Sacramento. The capital is in Sacramento. I'm sure he spends as much time as possible with his buddies in Napa, the wine country, all his fellow Luciferians. That's Gavin Newsom. But um, there are these artisanal craft beer places. And I just looked in Sacramento County a lot. That's my county. And there's just, I couldn't count them. There's, there's scores of them. And they're all small scale. And they must be making some kind of money. Otherwise, they would have, you know, some of them have gone on business. But there's, they're thriving. All right. Why are they thriving? I found out that craft beer is almost 25% of the total beer market. So forget Bud Light and uh, the transvestite actor, model, poser that, that everybody's having a gleeful moment about. He's irrelevant. What is relevant is that craft beer is a quarter of the existing total beer market. I didn't know it was that big. I was thinking maybe 10% at most. I didn't realize it's a quarter. And if you want to put a dollar, American dollar figure, that's $24 billion a year nationally in the United States alone. Now, that's not a big deal to countries like Germany, which have a, a beer culture and tradition going back generations. And, man, their beer is good. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is excellent, right? But that aesthetic finally came over to America, just like the coffee culture came over to America. If you can believe it, I told you about my days working for Sambo's Pancake Restaurant, right kitty corner from Disneyland in Anaheim. Well, they had their, their big calling card was the five cents bottomless cup of coffee. Right? Why was it bottomless? Because you can get all the refills you want. 
of mud. <laughs> it's, like, it's like sludge. And thank goodness we don't have that. Well, we have choices. You, if you want to buy Folgers or whatever it is, or instant coffee, go ahead. But it's no, it's no longer mandatory. You have a choice now. And that coffee culture was sort of free hipster, but it was kind of the cutting edge of it. And then craft beer was kind of cutting edge of that. Who knows what 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 new service or product is going to be coming available that is um, comes from grassroots ideas, not some globalist pseudo hippie, post hippies, post hipster company like Uber, right? With all the gadgets, because you know what? The, the retro hipsters are not into electro gadgetry, quite the opposite, right? They're, if anything, they, they, I don't know if they worship, but they're really into analog culture. Some of them are even buying little record players without being hooked up to their stereo system. And they're not doing the streaming. They're playing vinyl. It's not the majority, but just, just take a, a look on, on the retailers. It's a, it's a big and a growing market. So you might be getting some ideas on how you can service a particular niche within that market within craft beers. And maybe you have a homegrown uh, beef jerky business. You can produce it in small batches and package it up and sell it at your local brew pub. You know, there's all kinds of ideas. That's what America's uh, America is a nation of hustlers. You can be fresh off the boat and 20 years later, you can be a millionaire running a food truck service. That is America, and that dream is alive and well. I'm sorry for the middle-class professionals who are still hanging on to the old model, but time marches on, and thank goodness for the retro hipsters because they're, 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 they're dragging us along, kicking and screaming into the future. I'm not talking about the iPod future, the iPhone future, the uh, Elon Musk dystopian future, the Jeff Bezos future, but, but the retro future. It's the retro with a big difference. Could be called a hybrid economy, if you will. I mean, there's all kinds of people who are writing reviews. They're being published in the Harvard Business Reviews and the academic journals that are trying to figure out what's going on here. Because they want to sell that information to clients who, who plan on making tons of money on that information. And here I'm giving it to you free of charge. So the least you can do is subscribe to this channel and to share it. And if you want to help help me out on Patreon, that's hey, that Patreon is another example of the of the neo hipster economy. Someone said, "Hey, why don't we just go back to the medieval model of 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 patronizing creative people? You know, like me, I'm the fool, I'm the joker, I am the uh, the comedian that the king, you know, the jester, the king would would bring him on and subsidize him, right? He would be my patron." So you will be my patron. I'm the king fool. I'm the jester. I was the class clown of my graduating junior high school, Brookhurst Junior High School, Anaheim, California. So I have I have the credentials. Right? I have the horse to prove it. Some may see my entire uh, professional career as just one giant um, joke against these um, self-appointed guardians of official information. And that's, again, is another reason why the uh, neo hipsters or the new hipsters, the retro hipsters, that's another reason why they warm the cockles of my heart because they are anti authoritarian. Sure, they kind of buy a lot of the PR. They bought into Bernie Sanders. And by the way, the Bernie Sanders flame out was a big turning point for a lot of the neo hipsters. They realized that so called Democratic Socialists of America, the Greens fake that they were all infiltrated and bought out by corporatist NATO, Pentagon America. A lot of them figured that out. Right? Especially when Bernie Sanders got the election stole from him and he rolled over. Right? And conceded to uh, Hillary Clinton, who most of them are not enamored of, right? Some are, you know, they think they're insiders if they're in, in with uh, whoever's, you know, in charge. So we see the death of uh, Seth, um, is it Seth? I can't remember his last name. I'm sorry. Name's 
yeah, he, he was a, he was a Bernie, he was a Sandinista. And he found out that there was this whole layer of corruption that, that his idealistic leftist democratic socialist politics had blinded him to. And he wound up dead. Right. And on and there's more examples of that. Uh, on and on. So that's a big market craft beer. Take back Wall Street. That's about 20 years uh, ago. I think that was an organic movement. Right. That was going on in places like Seattle. And like within 20 years and with one generation, the trade unions, which are corporatist, NATO, United Nations organizations, teachers unions, auto workers, all of them, the unions, they're all globalist. They um, had reversed course and had thrown in with the House of Rothschild and Wall Street. I'm talking about the unions. Teachers unions in particular are not the friends of the neo hipsters. That's something we have to, to, to educate them about. And they're, they will listen because, like I said, they have little kids who are they're trying to figure out, well, where do we send them? Montessori? No, she was an occultist. Waldorf? No, that was Rudolf Steiner. He was an occultist. You know, do we can't send them to a public school because I'm um, overcrowded the quality of education. So homeschool? Yeah, maybe. All right. That's an opportunity for you there. We can just, in one, one fell swoop, decertify the teacher's education certification process and, and demolish so-called teacher education in the college and university. The Cal State universities, that is their bread and butter, is teacher education. And that's why the people who were involved in the leftist, communist, uh, state capture process hit the schools of education the hardest, from UCLA, Berkeley, to the Cal States. That's where, so we can eliminate that. And I think we have a, have a, a huge uh, audience for uh, hipster parents who want to educate their children to uh, in a manner that's that's most healthy to them intellectually as well as physically and spiritually. They're open to that because, you know, once you have children, the, the world changes, right? A latte, a, a latte with uh, all the, uh, the different extras, um, it, it takes on less importance to you. You'll start, you know, grinding your own coffee and having it home so you can pay the tuition <laughs> for, uh, for whatever, you know, your children need, sports, whatever. Now, do you think a neo hipster want to have their daughters enrolled in athletics? And they don't do that in public anymore. That's all been privatized. And there's these different sports leagues around. Do you think they want to have their daughters train methodically and learn discipline in swimming? Um, could be acrobatics, right? Gymnastics or soccer, lacrosse, whatever it is, or basketball only to be pushed aside by some guy who says, I'm a girl, I'm a woman. No, they're not down with that. So we got to mobilize this particular populate. I don't want to call it demographic. This populate, this vital, this robust, emerging population subgroup within the, I don't, when I say sub, I don't mean below. I mean this group within the larger network of people that make up American society. And they are multicultural and they're multiracial. Do you understand that? Yes, there are even Asian hipsters. Can you believe that? They're not all just stunning. But even the ones that are in school, they're, they are, you know, have, have that sensibility. There's one hipster, I bought a pedal that she signed. Her name is Yvette, uh, what's her last name? Young, Y-O-U-N-G. She plays solo guitar at a different level. She has a group called Covet. I think they're out of San Francisco. I have their first album. Not Coven, Covet. But she is, has just burst on the scene. She is one of the, the neo-hipsters, and she has her own pedal. This is her own art design. It's made by an older hipster, Zachary Vex, I don't know what his last name is. And a lot of the hipsters are making these pedals. 
it, it's not a, it's kind of a boutique. It's not like the beer industry. I looked it up, um, the pedal industry. I'm going to talk about graphic novels in a minute. Effects pedals, um, it is growing. It The sales reached um, 1.23 million in 2022, and it's growing. It's going up. Overall, I'm reading here from a tip sheet, an economic financial tip sheet for investors, institutional investors, my professionals. They look at everything. By the way, that's one of the advantages of being the university too, is that you learn to look at everything. You learn to turn all over all the stones, even if you don't want, or even if it's anathema to you, you will be exposed to it in some fashion. So I have no problem reading these reports. Um, and these people make, these consultants make tons of money, right? Not that I'm tempted to do it, but uh, I'm learning from them. I have to admit it, but they, yeah, they quantified it. Um, yeah, there was an increase of 21.9% of sales in pedals in 2021 over 2020. That's a 20%. I'm, I'm a, rounding it off. Growth, that's huge in one year. A lot of it had to do with COVID. No, I understand it's kind of tapering off and people were, were, were making music on their own. And that's another part of the neo-hipster DIY ethic, DIY ethic the, the retro hipster. They can make, I talked about this with the fall and the collapse of Disney. There's a whole generation, they call themselves makers, video makers, music makers, media makers, makers, creatives, creative con making their own movies, they're making their own music, and um, they're making their own pedals, their own effects. Uh, you can check this one out on a dedicated channel, right? There are those just on pedals alone. There's a whole per pedal nerd subculture in America, and they're all, all the people who run them are, guess what, neo-hipsters, who grew up with 60s music, psychedelia, <laughs> and they said, hey, we're going to use DSP technology and a little bit of analog. This is a favorite of them. It's called Microcosm, and it processes a regular guitar, electric guitar pedal. Electric guitar has been around since uh, the 1930s, but now it's possible with all this increased uh, processing power and the miniaturization and production uh, ability and the market for people to buy these and make music, their own soundtracks or for indie movies, for Mumblecore movie, which which is a, um, a film phenomenon that I've spoke about before in previous talks, but it's being taken seriously. It should be because that's again, another example of the hipsters who said, no, we're going to make uh, a movie for $50,000 filming all our friends and feeding them afterwards in our little kitchen. We're going to make this one. It's going to be about our lives. And we're just going to mumble our way through it. A lot of, that's why it's called mumble core because you can't understand the dialogue. But when you're talking informally around the kitchen table with your friends, your family, are you really listening to a professional speaker, a talking head? No, you're not. Real human com communication is a bunch is like a series of grunts and ellipses. Hey, write that down. Real human communication is a series of grunts and ellipses. It doesn't come out in perfect iambic pentameter like the uh, process synthetic guru, Jordan Peterson. See, and that's another example where the neo-hipsters are being led astray by these synthetic characters that are being pushed out there. No, mumblecore is where it's at. So they make these pedals. You can make your... I mean, look at micro loops, granules, multi-delay, warp, phrase loopers, looper only. You know where the looper came from, Violet, don't you? Donald Ewan Cameron, the Scottish immigrant to America and Canada, the Allen Memorial Institute, he used tape loop loops for psychic driving. And I don't know if these people here who produce luber pedals or effects pedal realize that what they've done is to liberate a mind control technology to to create beauty instead. Right? It could be used 
for nefarious purposes, don't get me wrong, but one of the reasons why I'm interested in, in this is to see how sound technologies, including ultrasonic neural modulation, mind control technologies, directed energy weapons, how it can be used and has been used in the past in recording, distribution, past and present, including bath, uh, back masking. You've heard about that back masking where they can put these demonic messages into LPs, right? That's a, a true, it's a real technology. And I have a pedal, by the way. Let's see, where is it? Excuse me. For turning my back on you. Oh, here, here's one. Yeah, check out their website. It's called Blo Old Blood Noise Company. It's a small company, probably 20, 30 people working. But they design and they manufacture. These are made in the USA. They're out of Oklahoma City. That's another thing. It's decentralized. You don't have to be in hipster L.A. to be part of the hipster con. You can live anywhere. Right? So they were promoting this pedal that does... It will reverse your either your audio, your voice, if you want to run it through here, or your guitar, and play it backwards, back masking. You've heard that effect early on some of the Beatles records, right? When they found out by accident that they flipped over a two-inch tape and it was backwards and they were hearing all these different messages. And they started saying, hey, let's make this part of the recording process. Well, now you don't need... Um, Audio tape, you can, it's not quite as good, but there are digital pieces of equipment that can do this. And the reason why I mention this is because this is what, this is all part of the retro hipster phenomenon that I'm trying to figure out. So I'm trying to, to uh, explore these sonic tools, just like um, has been done in the, in the times of uh, theremin. The Russian inventor with the theremin. And he, was, he was like a contemporary of Nikola Tesla, right? He was also a spy, by the way. <laughs> it's a really good bio, according to the one biography that I read about uh, theremin. Remember the, uh, well, you might not remember, the catchy hook to good vibrations? That's, that's a theremin. It was played by... Um, Guy who was, he taught jazz at UCLA, but he was also uh, an early adopter of uh, theremin. A lot of activity going on in LA, be, uh, outside of the studios, right? Outside of Dave McGowan's sort of cliched, recycled, oh, it was all CIA. There was a lot of genuine uh, sound experimentation that, that he's oblivious to, right? Not just in LA, but places like San Francisco. And I'm bringing in the fact that it probably originates with the psychic driving tapes of Donald Ewan Cameron of MK Ultra fame. Right. They use these repetitious loops at high volume over and, and that's a lot of EDM, electronic dance music, a lot of uh, witch trance. There's all these sub, 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 sub genres that are going on there. Right. And that's part of the so-called neo hipster subset that, that's out there, but I'm not going to focus on them uh, at this particular moment. Okay, let's look at another neo-hipster uh, phenomenon. And I was shocked at the size of this industry. I looked under comics and graphic novels because this is something that I started noticing in um, the late 70s. Remember, I went to Bowling Green State University and I earned a master's degree in popular culture studies. I've been doing this for a long time, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not a newbie. All right. I've been looking at this systematically since 1975-76. Right. Popular literature, science fiction, the Western music. Right. So... Uh, and uh, I wrote this article saying that Japanese popular culture in particular is going to sweep the nation. And that's one of the main objects of fascination with the neo-hipster 
generation. It's sort of like a neo japonisme In late 19th, early 20th century France, there was a whole, because of all the exotica that was coming in from Indochine, they were getting a lot of Japanese, you know, Toulouse, a low track, you know, the art history. They were being influenced by, by different perspectives, literally, you know, in, in, um, in uh, craft, right? Art, crafts, perspectives. Um, but there was a resurgence of that beginning in the probably 60s, 70s, 80s. And I was seeing this and I predicted, I wrote an academic paper and I have it somewhere. I should scan it and post it on my Patreon. I told you I'm giving away all these multi-million dollar secrets for you because I can't do it all. And truthfully, I'm more interested in observing the cultural forensic of society, especially where it concerns maintaining our freedom and autonomy in increasingly centralized, oppressive uh, state institutions, globalist institutions. Culture is the anti-hegemonic weapon against this, this encroachment. And that's another reason why I'm for the neo-hipsters, because they're doing it. They're even having listening sessions with their old LPs. They're bringing them there and they're drinking their craft beer and smoking a doobie and gathering around and they put everything into mono and a really decent 2023 sound system. And they're playing LPs and 45s. There's another one of mine. A lot of these records, the um, the hipsters would would die for. If they found them at a used record store. I bought these when they came out. You understand that? Okay. Not that I'm hip. It's just that I've been into it. That's why I have a fondness for them because they're rediscovering. What you never heard of? Uh, yes, prog rock. You're just discovering uh, Genesis or General Giant. You didn't know that Phil Collins and uh, Peter Gabriel came out of that whole movement. You didn't know who Rick Wakeman is? His first solo album, the, the, the Six Wives of Henry VIII. Vinyl, baby. That's where it's at. A&M Records. You know what the A stands for? Alpert, as in Herb Alpert. M stands for Moss. That's his business paper, uh, business partner. Oh, here's another. This is another. Hipsters would die for this one. Los Lobos. It still has a wrapper on it because I only cut this part to take the LP out. All right, it has a word. It has a lyrics printed on there. And you can look at the at the photos of dancing children and the and you can find out who the producers were and publication day. These guys are from East LA. They were part of the punk movement, even though they were rootsy. They did a lot of folklorico, northern Mexican folk music. And they grew up with blues. They loved Otis Rush, the same type of music. I grew up, they were growing up with on the east side of L.A., which, by the way, is now becoming part of the larger neo-hipster population movement from the west side to the east side. Do you understand? It, was usually, it used to be just a ghetto, mostly of Japanese Americans and the Mexican Americans. Now it's everybody. Anybody could afford it. It's getting expensive. Anyway, this is the light of the moon. Los Lobos, LP, they're great. And I didn't know that, I, you know, many years later, I'd be showing it. I was buying, you know, best of records, all the Young Rascals, the greatest hits, right? Gosh, this cost $5.99. Stereo, Super Savers, Atlantic. Felix Cavalier, one of the greatest organists, vocalists, of all times. You know their songs. I don't have to tell you. And my people. Right? Nobody's. My friend Michael Sasaki has been on my YouTube channel. He was a part of a group called the Nobodies. This is an all Asian rock group. And they were very much influenced by Latin. Because we all lived together under segregation. We lived am amongst black people and brown people. The yellow people of my generation. Right? Up until I was about 12 or, or, or maybe 10 or 11, I lived in a sort of resi residential segregation. So I just found this in my garage. I didn't have to. Yokohama, California. That's about my region right here. This is where I'm settled by Japanese immigrants in a farming. And then, of course, they were taken away 
into the concentration camps of America during World War II and held hostage. So their grandchildren making music out of their historical experience. So the hipsters are going to start revisiting their parents and their grandparents' history, and they're going to make music out of it. Here's um, an album with um, Chris Ijima, who was it? He was an attorney. He started out as a public school teacher, went, became an attorney, uh, went to the University of Hawaii. I think he was sort of an affirmative action outreach to Native Hawaiians. Uh, he passed away. He's with Jesus. I don't know if he was Christian or Buddhist, but when I die, that's who I'll be with. And then that's on the left is uh, Charlie Chin who was with a group called Cat and Mother and the All Night uh, All Night Newsboys. And you know the break on the long version of Bluebird with the banjo? Listen to Bluebird, Buffalo Springfield, the long version. That's him on banjo. So he was into Americana before Americana was cool. So he, they did an album, Grain of Sand. This is in the Smithsonian Institution of a Historically Important Audio Record. I have all of these, right? Some of you might be more familiar with Sam Cooke, the first black man to own his own publishing and recording properties, Sam Cooke, and he was murdered. It's probably a mob, mob hit. And they said it was a sort of a sex sort of deal, sort of like, they do to cover up some larger Sam Cooke. A change gonna come. Listen to that. Not the Rod Stewart version. This version written by Sam Cooke, who, by the way, comes out of the world of the church of gospel. There's two sides of Sam Cooke. He was with the soul stirs. Right. There's a whole gospel, black gospel, and there's a white gospel tradition here that's part of Americana. So these I bought when they came out. I was exploring. I was trying to figure out. I was trying to understand my place in the world. And this is what the neo-hipsters are doing right now. They're trying to find their place in the larger economic system, and they're beginning to do it. Okay, let me let me show you a little bit of it. I'm talking too much here. You might not know what a hipster community looks like. Right? You might think L.A. is just full of a bunch of gangbangers and drive-by shootings and, every, and poop everywhere, just like the conservative uh, hysteria media, indie so-called CIA media, limited hangout media, is portraying. It's a gross misportrayal. Most of L.A. is, is families. You understand that? So here's one community. Okay. You might sniff at it. Ah, there are a bunch of hipsters and blah, 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 blah. Um, complain to someone else. I, I, I think they're a very important engine of economic, cultural, social growth from now and into for the next couple of decades as they, you know, age out themselves and their children take over the helm. Because they will have children because the whole GLBT, transgender, transsexual, asexual, negation, surgery, uh, pharmacological and surgical um, mutilation. That's over. You understand that? And same with the medical doctors who are doing it. That's gone. Most of them, by the way, are, are foreign born. They, they have to come from some other country. Or it's just complete mercenaries who, who want to do the genital mutilation. I don't mean to smear all foreign born uh, surgeons, but this seems to me like they're way overrepresented in doing the cut and snip. So here's what a you know hipster community looks like. Yeah.
and that is a, a walking tour of Silver Lake. I like these channels where they have the body cam, right? I know that uh, we see all the footage of, of people being beat down with the police body cams, but why not use your body cams to walk around your neighborhood, post it so I can see what you're up to and what your neighborhood looks like, right? I think we're going to get a far different picture or video of what America is about as opposed to what's being put out there on CIANN or your local network affiliate. Their motto is, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. All right, but that's the mundane reality of life in Silver Lake, Los Angeles. Very nice area. It's getting, getting pricey, though. And there's a bunch of, by the way, there's a lot of, um, if you're into it, there's a lot of celebs that live out there, musicians, artists, and uh, actors, screenwriters. Silver Lake, that's supposed to be. Yeah, not the West Side. West Side's for the old boomers who made it in the the, the uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg year of Disney, which is all collapsing, right? This is where the growth is taking place. These are all the makers, the video, the audio, the creative forces, the pedal makers. Unless they're taxed and if they're harassed by county government of Los Angeles or city government or state of California, run by a bunch of socialists who don't want to see individual entrepreneurial capitalism at work, which is what's going to mobilize the neo-hipsters politically, because this is their livelihood. They're letting them build it up before they come in with the extortion racket, the protection racket. Do you understand? It's old as the Sicilian mafia or the Jewish mafia, right? Just like the CRT stuff and all these, these little stuff scores the corporate that's all mafia stuff that is just symbolic instead of throwing the bricks through your window they just say corporation we're going to put you on our website saying you are not a good corporate citizen that is so 1930s meyer lansky extortion mafia come on don't pay the ransom corporation because you know what the crap beer industry is eating your lunch and drinking your beer they be taken over Okay, let's see some more. This is um, this is my people, the yellow people. I don't want to be called Asian American anymore because Debra Deborah Wasserman Schultz said, "Oh, we don't want to have Robert F. Kennedy Jr. testify in Congress here because he made some anti-Semitic and anti-Asian American comments." Well, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, eat my. Here they are. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, eat my Schultz or my shorts. You get the Super Mario video under short award for Sunday, July 23rd, Debra Wasserman. So don't bring Asian Americans into your little trick bag, right? Because people aren't buying the anti-Semitism trope. So you got to bring in Asian. So that's why I'm not going by that. Just call me a yellow person. All right. Just call me a human being like the elephant man. All right. So here's my people. He's a yellow man. His parents are probably immigrants, hardworking immigrants from Korea, South Korea. The immigrants come to America. They want to make some money. They know that they can get paid if they put a lot of work and labor into it. That's why I'm not really so worried about the so-called open borders of the South, those people who come here to work, right? they're not going to be on permanent welfare unless the, uh, the the socialist communist like Deborah Wasserman Schultz puts them on the hacienda, the neo-hacienda or the latifunda, just like they got the black people on the neo-plantation. And there, there are a lot of African-American black people who are leaving the plantation in droves. And they represent a very large segment of the neo-hipster community. And I'm, if you want a reference on YouTube, look at the reaction videos. Most of them are black people and most of them are, are espousing conservative values without even really thinking about it. Because that's their default position. They're like Sam Cooke, brother Sam Cooke. They come out of the church. Their parents come out of the church. Their grandparents came out of the church. 
Their great parent, grandparents came out of the church. Their great 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 grandparents came out of the church. Do you understand? That's going to be that's a really strong tradition that they are rediscovering because they realize that hey, it's America. We got to do it ourselves here. Forget the plantation economy, the welfare state. All right, that's all part of the hipster economy. So we're going, we're looking at a bulkogi food truck. It's part of the LA food culture. That's something worth emulating around the country. It's already happening around the world, but um, it may not work so well now <laughs> in New York. The carts are probably better because there's not a lot of free places to park and open. But definitely LA, it's people are on wheels anyway. And it's a little more open streets. Uh, and the food truck phenomenon keeps growing and growing. Here's a uh, a uh, fellow yellow who is um, running a thriving business, Roy Choi. By the way, he has his own book out there. He has his own restaurant. He has, he has a retail store. He started out doing bulgogi tacos on the streets. He learned from his immigrant parents that, hey, if you want to make it in America, you got to go out and get it your SIF. And I forget about one of these BS jobs that are being offered to the Asian coolie labor up in Silicon Valley. Because as soon as they sell the company, your ass is gone. You want to be an owner. So that's what Chef Roy Choi did. I have his book, by the way. It's given to me as a present. Well, uh, Kogi, Kogi means meat. So like if you see this truck, when you see the word Kogi, it's like, if, it's like in LA, if you saw a truck that just had big old, big ass letters that said meat, M-E-A-T. That's what Kogi meant. Okay, so get set up. My partner, Mark, he came up with the idea. We were both working at four star, five star hotels. He came to me and said, Roy, let's open a taco truck. And I was like, you serious? His idea was to put Korean barbecue in a taco. And uh, for me, I grew up here in LA. So the street taco has been a part of my life ever since I was a kid. So when, when, I, when he came to me with that idea, I, I just thought, you know, I can do it. I know the flavors and, you know, and it was a chance for me to cook Korean food as well. So our first spot was West Hollywood on Robertson. So there's these three nightclubs that are all really hip. And we thought, okay, we'll roll up right on Robertson in Santa Monica, open our doors and see what's up. Uh, within like the first 10 minutes, we got kicked out. And on, on the weekdays where there were no clubs, we would post up on Hollywood Boulevard and there'll be like, it was like, we couldn't beg people to eat it. I'd be cooking and then Mark would be out on the street trying to peddle tacos and no one would eat it. Once people ate it, they kind of dropped, you know, and they're like, oh my God, and they started telling friends. They would take pictures, you know, and send it out to all their friends and put it on their Facebook, all right? And, um, you know, we did a lot of social media. What happens is every time we move or if we update or if I think of a special, we hit up our Twitter and then however, however many followers follow that Twitter get our information instantly on the text. It's worth the calories. The, the first prototype idea was uh, Purugogi taco, which is literally means like fire meat. So then I started looking into different fattier cuts, and then from there, really the, the short rib taco developed. So another uh, beef burrito, another chicken burrito. If you really want to go into something that you, you you have a vision of, don't let any any outside pressures dictate or define what you're going to do. You know, this is like kind of your voice. This is your art. So just go out there and do it. If you can cross that bridge, that kind of courageous bridge of like putting yourself out there to the people, and then you just let it go. There you have it. He's made a career out of uh, being indie and being a person who's catering to, um, I guess it's largely an Asian, uh, a yellow audience, but it, it crosses boundaries. LA has a really, a really good food culture. It's really improved from, from the time uh, that I that I lived there years and years ago. Uh, I don't know what it's like the rest of the country, but I think it's better than uh, New York City, definitely. Um, in terms of fresh produce and fruits and all the other stuff that comes out of Central California right here, even though they try to cut our water supply off, privatize it, right? So this is what the new hipsters uh, are going to have to protect. Their, their political, uh, their economic investment in the now economy. And they will respond. Roy Choi will respond to the threat. 
just like his parents responded to the threat of impoverishment if they had stayed in South Korea, living under a military, U.S.-sponsored military-style dictatorship. Right? They said, no, we're going to L.A. <laughs> She's going to check out Koreatown in L.A. It's much larger than little Tokyo ever was or even Chinatown. So here's a guy from another part of the world. He's Middle Eastern. Uh, they're not all terrorists. They're not all military age men sneaking over the southern border. There's probably some, but they're not going to get very far because we're waiting for them. For one thing, we're prepared. This guy is a businessman. I don't know how much he makes every year, but he's given some some dollar figures right here. This guy came to America 20 years ago. He's a hipster. He's doesn't fit the profile, but in my mind, he's a hipster. I'd like to know how much a food truck owner makes. It will definitely surprise you. My name is Saeed. I'm the owner of Ebla Mediterranean Grill, and I own three trailers, and I will show you how to make 200K a year by opening a food car business. That sounds incredible, you guys. Let's get started. Tell us a little bit about your background, your story, and what got you into this business. Yeah, I started a uh, child with uh, my mom back home in Syria uh, from a small village. I'm a farmer, and now I'm uh, in the U.S. for the last 21 years. I started my first food truck in 2004. It was hard because I didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. I had to borrow money from here and there to open my first food cart. But why food cart? You could have started a restaurant, any other business. Why this particular food truck business? I didn't know better. I'm, I, I'm a cook. I can open a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Food cart is a good way and it's low risk. You can take it anywhere. You can sell it whenever you like. You can move it whenever, whatever you like. Awesome. Say, let's talk about monthly expense. Uh, where are you dollar-wise per month, and what's the biggest expense monthly? It's a tough question. It depends. If you have, if you're family operated, it doesn't cost you too much to operate a trailer, like maybe 200 a day, 300. Food cost, propane, gray water, mm -hmm. electricity and rent, insurance, tax. If you are by, if you have employees, to break even, you need to make $500 a day. At least. With two employees, I'm guessing. With two right? employees, yes, okay. to break even. So the biggest expense is labor? Labor, biggest expense, yes. And then what will be the other one after that? Food cost. Food cost, okay. Food cost. You're obviously paying rent here. What is that per month here, uh, at least? Here is not bad. It's now uh, it used to be 1200 Now it's 1350 How does that compare to other locations? Is that pretty good? Pretty good, actually. Is, okay. Other location um, could be busier than here mm -hmm. uh, because they have a tent, they have fire pit outside, they heat their customer more. I mean, this is a big lot. It's hard to heat up. 2500 wow. some other lot to start, which is, that's really expensive to start a food car. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. If it's good lot, you gotta make it. But don't be afraid of the rent. I did. I was afraid once and I regret it big time. Afraid to pay big rent? I lost good location and I regret it big time. So he's saying, roll the dice, <laughs> make that commitment. Yeah, it might, it might be a little scary, but the payoff could be really good. I mean, you can go down in flames, but, uh, you know, uh, the uh, it might be worth your investment. You know, you won't know uh, unless you try. So keep on hustling. Uh, I didn't look up how much the food truck business is making. Uh, you can look that up on your own. It's a hard, I mean, I don't. I don't see any of these businesses, enterprise, family enterprises, are are easy. They're really difficult to do. I've been part of family businesses multiple times. They're really hard. Um, and there's there's no benefits. There's no insurance. There's no pension plan. It's just uh, it's uh, ethnic auto exploitation. That's why they want immigrants because they they're not going to go on the the rolls, but they're going to be working in the in the parents' um, liquor store or the gas station or, or, the, or the food truck, right? So, don't, you know, don't think it's easy. I don't think anybody's that ignorant, but uh, but it's probably a multi-million dollar business. I did check out the figures for uh, graphic magazines. And again, this is something I started identifying late 70s, 80s, and 90s. I don't want to bore you with with my comic book collection. I just had a I just found them in my garage while I was looking at records. But I have tons. I, I keep them in wrappers. I read them once and I store them away. There's one of Gojira, 
Japan became really big in the 80s, like I predicted. There's a comic book. Um, it's mainstream. It's Dark Horse. It's uh, Gojira, Godzilla. But alternative stuff as well. One-offs. Usagi Yojimbo. I met Stan Sakai. He was an early Funny Animals cartoonist from L.A. I have an autograph of one of these. Usagi. He draws from Japanese uh, cinema for that. And um, kind of riffing through this. Oh, yeah, here's one. This guy comes from Sacramento. I think he went to Berkeley, UC Berkeley. His name's Adrian Tomine. And he started doing an, and I have the earlier version. There should be a good um, comic book store in the local mall. It's gone now, of course. And they used to have comics at the um, Tower Bookstore, which is also gone. <laughs> Um, so I used to pick up earlier comic books here. There's some downtown too. Maybe there still are, but I got the earlier version. He really improved his story, his story and his, his, um, draftsman skills. Optic nerve is his comic book. He became big and it looked like he was going, but I don't, I have you know, I don't know what he's doing now, but he did have a future. This is all hipster type of work. It was just give you an idea of how big the which is a surprise to me. Uh, the graphic novel business, including comic books, is a $1.47 billion business per year. And again, it jumped up 75% in only one year. I think this is during COVID. People are staying home and reading and illustrating, honing their classes, figuring out they don't need to be in, at the office and they don't need to be in public school their kids are much better off not going into school and learning how to behave badly and being neglected and being taught a bunch of uh, curricular union, CRT, critical race theory, so-called GLBTQ uh, union uh, prop, uh, communist propaganda. So anyway, there's, there's all kinds of uh, facts on it. Those are just some of the industries that I selectively focused in, in on based on what was around my studio and, and uh, packed kind of semi away in my garage, right? Because I observe this, I, I study this. And um, it's getting, unfortunately, academic attention. Here's a journal, it's called Mechademia. It's all a bunch of academic garbage and gibberish about different aspects of Japanese popular culture. Um, these are now being translated. These are known as manga. It's a Japanese innovation. By the way, hip hop and rap is a Japanese art form. It's not black, it's Japanese. I hate to tell you that. I know all you Jay Dilla fans and all the other people, you know, all the way to yay, right? Hip hop and rap would not be possible if it were not for the wide availability of inexpensive Japanese consumer electronics, including the boom boxes, right? Or the ghetto blasters or the third world briefcase all the way to the machines like the MPC, the Akai. And that's true to this day. So when I say there's a hipster economy and it's global, that's another example. The designers like that are like in their twenties and thirties. I have some videos of them. And they're cosmopolitan. They're all over the place. They've, they're based in London. They're based in Berlin. They're based in New York. They're just getting a feel for this whole international global hipster culture. And they're making music and making tools and equipment for that segment who are not relying on Hollywood or, or uh, Universal for the big contract. They're doing it themselves. All right. So when I'm talking about economic re revitalization and growth. This is not wishful thinking. This is empirical fact. Or as Bill Murray once said, it's a fact, Jack. All right. Finally, when I conclude this talk here, I said I was trying to hold it down in 90 minutes, right? I got to go and get my, you know, my brew beer and a um, organically raised <laughs> hamburger over a device brewery five minutes from me. Uh, I'm sinking past. It's so hot in here. But we're going to end. I'm going to show you, most importantly, the neo-hipsters 
right? The retro hipsters, they have a sense of humor, which they they're it's antithetical. It's everything that you've you've been um, trained to dis to 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 dislike in indie, in so-called conservative media. Oh, they're narcissistic. They're selfish. They're into style. They're superficial. They're trendy. Blah blah blah. They drink soy milk and. They are into ethically sourced materials and you know, veganisms and their soy boys and all that. You know, that garbage has got to end. That rhetoric is dead in the water. You understand that? Okay. Because they have a sense of humor about themselves more so than indie people do. And conservatives don't have, they're very titchy. Oh yeah, you can you uh, you insult them, and they get very offended. But the um, the neo hipsters is secure in herself and himself about who they are. Right, they're working through it, and they're producing something here. Now, I don't know if they understand in an objective sense what they represent on the macro scale, but it's that sense of purpose and. Uh, groundedness that I haven't seen since my parents' generation. My parents, you know, whatever lacks they had, they knew who they were. They knew what they had to do in order to make it, and they went and did it. All right, and they didn't complain and bellyache and say, "Please, De Debbie Blabbermouth Schultz, pre please protect us," right? Because we're this this sort of vulnerable minority, quote unquote minority. In truth, uh, so far as yellow people in America, we're the majority in, in terms of income and salary level and education level. We're, we're up there. All right. So Deborah and also Jews, you know, anti-Semitic, supposedly, according to Robert. That's a mischaracterization, by the way. And he went up into Congress and said, you're lying, Deborah Baba Mouse shows all of you people. You're into censorship. You do not invoke the Kennedy name on my behalf. Because we thought the Kennedy family was about liberal democratic values for real. And they gave their lives for it. He took them to school. Or whatever you think about RFK Jr., he took B Debbie Blabbermouth Schultz and all those Democrats in Congress who are going to be voted out. Guess by who? Yes, the neo-hipsters are getting rid of them because they realize that that model of governance, the Bernie Sanders model is dead. And they know that because they're working, they're drawing comic books, they're making music, they're at the record stores looking for LPs so they can sample them or make their own records, their own recordings. They're doing creative work, they're doing fashion, you know, on and on and on. They're designing pedals, they're employing their friends. Right. But they have a sense of humor about themselves as a group. Case in point, here we go. This is a channel that I would encourage you to look at. It's called, what, Bumblebee? Let me see here. I have it in my notes. It's new to me, so I have to refer to my note here. It's part of the political reunion. Yeah, Babylon B, it's called. Right, And they started as a small site. It was church Christian related. And it just blew up. And now even Elon Musk, whatever you think about him, I don't trust him at all. He's trying to get on the sort of the neo-hipster bandwagon. Oh, yeah, I'm going to smoke dope with with, with uh, Joe Rogan, who's part of that hangout group, as he figured out by now. But then he wanted to be on the show because he wants to capitalize on the whole neo-hipster aura. Right. But anyway, this Babylon, that's, check it out, Babylon. Babylon B, and this is a piece called, um, you know, your, your baby might be a white supremacist. <laughs> okay. Hi, have you or a loved one had a baby recently? We hate to say this, but you might've just brought a white supremacist into the world. Don't worry though, we're here to help. It's important to always look for clues of racist tendencies in your newborn so that you can nip that in the bud. Here are five troubling signs that your baby might be a white supremacist. Sign number one, he's white, which automatically makes him a racist. If your newborn is white, then sorry, it's game over. Your baby will be irredeemably racist forever. 
sad. Sign number two, your baby has no hair, which is a common neo-Nazi hairstyle. Is your baby a skinhead? Having no hair is a colossal red flag. Here's a big one. Shows his white fragility by crying all the time. Crying is a sure sign of defensiveness and a fear of honest conversations around race. Not good. Four, your baby refuses to say Black Lives Matter. Seriously, what is so hard about saying Black Lives Matter? If instead he says things like Goo Goo Gaga, this is even more troubling. The phrase Goo Goo Gaga has 10 letters in it. Do you know what else has 10 letters in it? Heil Hitler. Five, your baby shows colorblindness by playing with other kids regardless of their race. But here's the kicker, colorblindness is racist. Minorities need their own separate spaces without white invaders. Decolonize your playtime, mom and dad. If you remain vigilant, you may play a part in preventing another baby from becoming a racist. Uh, unless he's white, of course. There's nothing you can do about that. There you have it. Very well done. Yeah. The people who are complaining, you're reading their sites, you're seeing them on the media, talking about the libtard, blah, blah, blah. They're not going to change anything. They're, you're just there to get you more and more riled up. They're creating these fake enemies just like the other side does. Well, Bumblebee Media said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to make fun of it. And that's how, that's how we will win. We will parody. We will spoof them to death. How's that? <laughs> okay, that's my time, ladies and gentlemen. I got to get myself some sparkling mineral water. Imported, of course. Right? And uh, put a little cranberry um, extract in there, cranberry juice. And once I cool down, I'll go to my local brew pub and have some artisanal beer and a um, uh, Black Angus organic hamburger, probably. Anyway, maybe probably not. I'll probably stay home and eat noodles or something. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, putting up with me for this fun hour and a half, 90 minutes, a bit longer than that. Today, I had a great time prepping for this. It's counterintuitive, I know. Uh, people are getting addicted and getting used to Sturm und Drang, storm and stress, right? Just bad news. It's it's over. Buy gold, buy Health Ranger products, stock up on ammunition. Armageddon's happening. Well, I'm here to tell you that keep dreaming because <laughs> I know that's part of your business model, Mr. and Mrs. Alarmist, who run these organizations behind these shows and sponsor other YouTube channels, but that's not the reality out there, right? So go to your neighborhood, take your little camera out there and send me a link, post a link there to your YouTube channel so I can see what, what's going on in St. Louis. And um, you pick whatever town, wherever you are, right? Overseas, you know, I, I want to see. And there's tons of material like that on TubeU. So I started looking at those too. And you'll see that the normalcy is the norm. Yeah, there's a lot of squalor in LA. We know about that. We know about homeless. There's a lot of problems out there. But that's all that both sides ever want you to see. Right? I say, let's look at the areas of growth and health. And let's support it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's my time. I'll see you next Sunday. God willing, I hope I get all the material in because I want to do my piece on Jason Aldean. Is this all part of some sort of PSYOP? Are we being set up for another mass shooting a la Las Vegas country music festival? They're going to blame it on some gun-toting crazy redneck? Are we being set up? I don't know. You know, and I did look at the video a couple of times. Try this in a small town. Check it out. Yeah. Jason Aldean might be part of that. I don't know. Hard to say. It's kind of like, you know, it's a Chinese puzzle. <laughs> Sorry. Am I offending any Chinese people there? You know, 
It's an enigma wrapped into an enigma. How's that? That's more Churchillian of a metaphor. But anyway, I hope to have that ready for you next Sunday. If nothing else, I want to revisit the Stephen Hadley murder because I, I checked on the retail that ate the world. There's nothing really good on that on that shooting. The, the best I can come up with was this particular book. And I can already tell it's it's mainstream. And the rest of it's a bunch of garbage. These pamphlets that are pseudo books. They're just like compilations out of stuff by, by some jerkwad. And that that's the downside of of indie media. There's a you know the barrier for entry is so low that almost anybody can get in. But that's where you can discern and look at the reviews to see who's a jerkwad, who's an amateur, who's an UB, who's a sensationalist, and who's a clickbaiter. Right. Okay. That's my time. See you later. Have a good evening. Bye.